At the beginning of 1991, Wayne Shelford returned home from playing club rugby in England, determined to get his all-black jersey back. <sighs> the odds weren't in his favour. But then again, he's not the sort of guy you'd want to bet against. Let alone play against. If you're playing with him, he's an inspiration, leading from the front, doing what has to be done. And during one of the golden periods of all-black rugby, he was the face and the four-letter word which led the way. For Buck Shelford, training is more than just another night at the office. It's the hard work that got him where he was before and hopes to be again. Never in New Zealand rugby history has the dropping of a player, much less an all-black captain, caused such an uproar as the removal of Buck Shelford after 14 unbeaten tests as captain. It's the measure more of the man than just the player that caused the words, bring back Buck, to echo around the country. Of course, the strongest support for Shelford can be found at the Devonport Domain, home of the North Shore Club, where respect is not a strong enough word to describe how they feel about their number eight. He's just an absolute marvel for the club, I think. Everybody likes him, from the seniors right down. They think the world of him. And his play, well, he, the team is different. When Buck's playing, North Shore is 100%. We see him as God, and we're as... Uh... 23 disciples down here at the club. But every time he turns out there's a, a big following and particularly obviously at this time of the year we'd like to see him get back in that all black jersey. There's a lot of people down here, you know, particularly don't believe he should ever have lost it. Maybe we're just parochial, I don't know, but uh, that's Buck, he's one of us and uh, we're pretty proud of it. But while Shelford has become synonymous with North Shore, that's not where it all started. The North Shore number eight is a Rotorua boy. That's where he got the nickname Buck for his protruding teeth. And it's where his love of sport and competition was fostered at an early age. We'd always go to our local park, which was only about 50 metres away. And just the gangs, you know, the, 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 the group would, um, would be together for, spend the whole of Sunday on the park. Just playing soccer, playing ball rush, playing touch football, playing everything. You know, somebody end up crying and running home and telling fibs and next minute we'll all be called home, things like that. But... Uh, that was good. Yeah. Enjoyed uh, my, my time as a youth playing rugby. What was he in the first 15? He had the nicest legs in the first 15. And he was my, best, my brother's best friend. So he was around home quite a bit. And I think it was his 17th birthday and he just joined the Navy. And we are having a going away party and sort of started going out from there. Great romance stuff. <laughs> of course, it's not all candlelit dinners when you're married to an all black. At times, Joanne has needed to be just as strong as her husband, especially with the long periods of separation forced by both rugby and the Navy. Shelford had signed up in 1974, learning the training disciplines that were to serve him well throughout his rugby career. In the Navy, Shelford began to grow up fast. The young guy being overseas at the age of 18, you know, um, pretty naive and it's the way things go. And, you end up going out with a few of the older guys and they take, to all, take you to these places that went, my God, it really opens your eyes up. Shelford's football was also maturing. After making the New Zealand Colts, Buck was eventually brought into the Auckland A-side in 1982, where he served for a couple of years, before the North Harbour Union was formed. In 1985, the North Shore No. 8 had a decision to make, whether to stay with Shore and play for the new North Harbour Union, or head across the bridge to continue his Auckland career. He had no hesitation. Perhaps the real success of North Harbour was uh, basically around two players, Frano Boddicker and, and Buck Shelford. Um, and we were very fortunate to have two players of that ability. One reached his potential, the other one never did in rugby. And uh, I think we were very fortunate that at an early age, uh, or the, our formative year, we, we had those two players available. Well, I found there was a new attitude towards North Harbour that I never saw when I was with Auckland, because Auckland had been around for so long and uh, being part of it was, uh, was, was great. I thought it was brilliant. As well as heading North Harbour's charge to the top of the third division, Shelford was in big demand. And while leading the emerging players on an internal tour, the 27-year-old Shelford learnt that his name was on the team sheet for the All Black Tour of South Africa. Joe was in labour in uh, the North Shore Hospital at that time and, uh, and I rang her up, we talked we talked on the telephone and she was very happy about it and, uh, and lo and behold only two days later my son was born and uh, you know what a great week. Working on the blind side. 
But the All Blacks didn't get to South Africa. Politics sent them to Argentina instead, where Shelford got his black jersey, playing second string to Murray Mixted. The following year started well for Shelford, sharing in New Zealand's victory at the Hong Kong Sevens. And then it was off to South Africa as a Cavalier, a decision which cost him his Navy career. I resigned to go on the tour because uh, the rules of the day stated that uh, as being a government, <coughs> being in a government job, that I uh, I couldn't go, even though I had the leave to take, uh, the annual leave to take. They wouldn't give it to me, so I actually left. And uh, when I got back to New Zealand, uh, it was only about a month after being back inside the country that I'd applied to join up again, and uh, um, sort of thing is they wouldn't let me join up again. But Shelford's visit to South Africa was a boost to his rugby career. He showed tremendous form and was getting even closer to a test spot. After South Africa, he missed out on the series against Australia following the Cavalier suspensions and then a broken hand. But in the first test against France, he made up for lost time. Side, controlled by Shelford. Strong scrum from the All Blacks. Shelford! Wayne Shelford on his test debut. <laughs> Shelford's second test was even more memorable for all the wrong reasons. That infamous day at Nantes when the All Blacks got dealt to. I lost three teeth, got badly concussed. I still can't remember the game that well. Even when I watch it on videotapes, I still can't remember segments of the game. Um, and I got 18 stitches put in my groin. So you, know, you don't forget games like that. And uh, the way we actually lost that game... Uh, sort of thing is it, it sticks in your mind that uh, you lost and you lost badly. Buck's horrific catalogue of injuries finally forced him to leave the field that day, a day when the All Blacks were stunned by the ferocity of the French side's sudden reversal of form. Shelford's opinions on that defeat were to hit the headlines four years later. They'd been pumped up with something and uh, they were thriving on it that day. They were pumped up on what, some drug or whatever? Well, it must have been something. It was an orange juice. I'm just an honest guy just trying to play football the best way I know and when media people come up to me and ask questions I give them a right answer and that's all I can do and it, you know, I don't go away with a guilty conscience um, you know and I, I feel happy with the answers I give Buck was pretty happy with the answers he was giving on the field after Nantes it was 1987 and the charge for the World Cup was on In the semi-final against Wales, the All Blacks and Shelford were virtually unstoppable from the beginning. That was until a piece of Shelford support play almost stopped him taking his place in the final. This is absolutely extraordinary stuff. This is a real dockyard brawl. I don't believe fighting is a part of the game, but sometimes it, if it does happen, you finish it quickly and get on with the game. I don't believe uh, Hugh Richards had any right to carry on the way he did. Um, the reason why he done it was, or well, Gary hit him, was because you know, he had Gary by the family jewels, and Gary gave him a bit of a nudge, and he just carried on and carried on, and basically I just stepped back and just went, you know, whack. And it's number five, is it? That's going. And I would say that Wayne Shelford was very lucky not to go off as well. And yes, he's off. It's an early shower for Hugh Richards. In other words, I was lucky. Um, there's a lot of people that you know do get sent off but um, um, Hugh was seen as the instigator and he got sent off in the final Shelford playing with three broken fingers and the memory of Nantes played a vital role in the all black victory out of the corner of my eye all I saw was his white white head and it was JK and you know didn't have to see his face all I knew was it was white and he picked it and he just headed for that corner and uh, I was getting off the ground when he was scoring it so it was uh, absolutely great to see that try actually happen there was plenty to celebrate. The trophy was in the All Black Cabinet, and Shelford had gone from being the best in New Zealand to the best in the world. North Harbour halfback feeds the scrum. He finished the domestic Shelford season by leading North Harbour to the first division by scoring three tries in the decider. But even then, there was more to come. The All Blacks so needed a new captain, and they had just the right guy for the job. The tackles, we're missing tackles. Rocky's getting away with bloody murder. 
Bex. When Buck Shelford talks, others usually listen. Let's just think about it, the scrum. We're not pushing through, are we? We're hitting and we're just holding them. And bloody Dowdy's nearly getting no, strikes there. taken off him. Come on, let's hit and we put it through them. The bloody ball's running the opposite way to where you are all the time. Get involved. Tell Fox you want to come in. When David Kirk left for Oxford, Shelford got his chance to give the All Blacks a good talking to as captain of the Tour to Japan in 1987. The, the, the Tour was a stunning success. 408 points for, 16 against. And Shelford had established himself as the All Black leader. Whereas a lot of uh, captains do it by um, articulate means or uh, some other form of motivation. Buck is able to do that, but he, I suppose it's the old lead by example. Uh, he puts his body on the line uh, for the team and players sort of respond to that. Getting the captaincy, I thought uh, it was a great honour. Um, I think I thrived on it, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the captaincy and um, sort of thing is, um, I expected the players to captain themselves. The next year, it was no surprise that Shelford was kept in charge as he led the All Blacks to their steamroller efforts against Wales. And he showed after the first test how high his standards were. They'd won by 50 points, but he was looking for better. Finishing off is uh, the thing that uh, well, didn't disappoint me, but uh, I think uh, we could pick it up a little bit. Yeah. Ten tries, though. Ten tries, yeah, it's, that, that's a good tally, but uh, never know, it could have been 13 or 14. By the time the All Blacks hit Australia, Shelford was firmly established as the man in charge. He led from the front as the All Blacks swept the Australians aside. After a slight hiccup in the drawn second test, the All Blacks were determined to end the series in style. Shelford again was to the forefront. Steve Cutler, 20 metres out from the All Black line. There was an incident in that match that was typical Shelford. Caught at the bottom of the ruck, Shelford's head was badly cut by an Aussie boot. But the Australian crowd didn't have too much sympathy for the All Black captain. So after having his head put back together, Shelford reacted by shoving their boos back down their throats, storming the All Blacks into action. I think one of the, the games I've enjoyed the most would have been Australia in 88, uh, the third test, when uh, we were down, uh, we, we, we were winning, and uh, by a reasonable score, and it was probably you know, 10 minutes from the end of the game, where the guys were absolutely shattered, and then you'd get, I'd say something, and they'd say, let's go, let's just ram it home, you know, that we are a great team. And right up until the last two or three minutes of the game, the guys of like Sean Fitzpatrick, Stevie, let's pick the pace of the game up. And we were absolutely shattered at that stage because we've done so much running. By the end of the Australian tour, Shelford had been elevated to almost supernatural status by the New Zealand fans. It was something that had already happened back in North Harbour, where Shelford's nickname wasn't Buck, it was simply God. I think that little man called Fran Botica is one of the instigators and... Uh, um, I believe uh, Cowboy Shore used to have that name. A few of the guys on the North Shore used to uh, think Cowboy was God. Cowboy Shore was God. And as soon as he retired, because they were calling me Jesus at that time, and uh, oh, um, sort of thing as uh, Cowboy faded into the um, into retirement scene, and uh, the next minute Frano starts calling me blooming God and little cheeky little bugger. But then, all of a sudden, Shelford's godlike captaincy started to be questioned as he led the Māori All Blacks on a world tour that can be best described as eventful. For Buck, the tour had its share of incidents, but was enjoyable. Māori rugby is something that has always been important to him. But while he headed to a club season in France after the action-packed encounter in Tuckerman, the knives were being sharpened back home for Shelford's back. The critics were saying it was time for a change. Zambuk has to be the best non-test player in international rugby. He has Wayne Shelford, keeping him away from that number eight all-black jersey. New Zealand's been lucky to be blessed with number eights of such talent. The only problem is only one can play test matches for the all-blacks.
Sonny and I get on very, very well. Uh, I respect him as a player. He's a great player. And uh, I, I like the guy because he's, uh, he's always got something going on within his mind and you know, whatever he's doing. He's always doing something different. And uh, I like him. He's, uh, he's a good team man. He's a real good team man. And uh, he's a great footballer. Despite Brooks' challenge, Shelford kept his place for what turned out to be a tough test series against the French. In the second test, Shelford showed how tough it was. Murray Pearce was going Murray off Pierce. to get a bad gash in his cheek stitched. But the captain decided there would be time for that later. There was a scrum to be seen too. They want Murray Pearce on for the scrum. No medical attention for these men, the unsmiling giants would take the pain. When you're with the All Blacks. It was a tremendous effort from the fours and a tremendous um, backing up from our backs. Any report on Murray Pearce and Sean Fitzpatrick? They look pretty uh, battered and bruised as they came off in particular. Oh, they'll be right. I think they'll survive through the night as well. Buck had a tough battle in this test series against the French Superman Rodriguez. And although he led the All Blacks to another hard-won victory against the Australians, the goodbye Buck lobby was getting stronger. And when Gary Wetton was named vice-captain for the Tour of Wales and Ireland at the end of the year, some took that as the end of Buck Shelford. They couldn't have been more wrong. Touring brings out the best in Buck Shelford. He enjoys touring life and the camaraderie that comes with it. And at the end of 1989, when many thought Shelford was down and out, he was determined to come out on top. He responded to the challenge by playing some of the best rugby he'd produced in the All Black jersey. One game in particular will be remembered when Shelford led from the front as the All Blacks battled into a gale in Clinetley. Right in the view of their team, Shelford going right to Deans. Oh, just short. And the try scored. Shelford coming into his own. What a great run by Wayne Shelford. The second half performance then, if, if Shelford hadn't have been leading that team, they would have lost that game. I think that's a classic example of a guy that took hold of a game with a 100 mile an hour wind and just controlled it. Uh, sure, that's crazy to say that there weren't 14 other guys out there falling into the pattern, but he took hold of the game. The conditions are absolutely atrocious. That wind was an absolute gale and uh, it was very hard to play with. Hard to talk to each other because the wind was so, you know, it was in your ears all the time. and. Uh, hardly hear the communication but the guys stuck together and uh, we came out with a bloody great win. Even the Harkers were getting fiercer which in turn prompted some fierce opposition from the challengers. It was all straight out of the Shelford philosophy. At that stage of the ball game of that tour in 89 the All Blacks were really getting into the Harker because it started to mean something to them and um, in that Ireland game you know where Willie Anderson brought his, his crew up and they walked up to us and we walked up to them uh, it was a great confrontation and it was a great challenge and uh, I think Willie you know was uh, basically slapped on the hand for it for actually doing that and um, with the average person back here in New Zealand would have said Maori person would have said you know well done they stood up to the challenge and that's how they played. The New Zealand team bets the 19 international wins in a row. Shelford became victim of that Irish challenge in the first minutes most of the pack landed on his neck he was in a lot of pain Somebody is on the deck. Somebody is on the deck. It's Wayne Shelford who took the ball and backed in to the Irish players as they kicked through there, a stormy beginning. But the captain but stayed on, turning in a typical Shelford performance. The team that's behind on points at the moment, the Irish. That's Brewer, and that's Shelford, and that's a try for the All Black captain, and how appropriate. Right in the last minute of the last test match of the decade, one of the most powerful figures of the decade, Wayne Shelford, scores a try to end a remarkable game. The sequence of victories is out to a record number 19. And the 80s finish for the All Blacks tested to their limit. But as they've done since 1986, coming through triumphant. A week later, Shelford was looking to finish off the tour against the Barbarians. But each time he went down, it seemed someone would land on his injured neck. As they call the England locks, here's Davies. That's the goal line in the background. Penalty for the Barbarians. And I think Shelford is in bad shape. 
And they make call-ins in Zandbrook. Look at this here now. Look, he just sort of... He, you never see Shelford go like that. And then he realised he'd missed him and knew what. He, said, he suddenly realised Vela was a better part of G. Look, and he thrashes him then to the ground and down he goes on that same side. And while Shelford tried to stay on, at half-time, even he couldn't continue. Some thought he might retire after that tour, going out at the top. But Shelford wasn't quite ready yet for the changing of the guard. In 1990, Shelford was there again, leading the All Blacks against Scotland, who just won the Grand Slam, and they proved to be tough opponents. The All Blacks won both tests, but only just, and the buck was about to stop with Shelford. Good evening. The most successful All Black captain ever, Buck Shelford, is in hiding tonight after being dumped from the team. You know, at the moment, it, he's not playing to the, the form that uh, we know Buck Shelford can. Well, the All Blacks are still there. It, um, you know, as Chris has already said, that uh, the opportunity's there, and if I'm playing well enough, he'll select me. But, uh, you know, I've got to look at it in a different vein now, and I think uh, I'll take everything as it comes. He rang up, and I was home by myself, and I thought, he said, I'm not an All Black anymore. I'm not in the team. I wasn't selected. I thought, oh, phew, phew, oh, okay then, I'll see you in half an hour or whatever. And then it was like an hour before we got home, and in that hour I had actually turned right around, and I was so angry by the time we got home. I thought, why, what happened, what's the guts, no one's, we haven't heard from anybody. And I was really angry, you know, much angrier than he was. Buck had a look on his, of hurt, I could only describe it as hurt on his face, that, you know, why. And we were talking on Friday, in my, on the Friday in my office, and he said, Peter, I'm not even a reserve. And I said, well, you can't be, because of the, you know, the influence has to be taken away, otherwise it would be perceived in other people's eyes that um, they couldn't do their job properly because the deposed leader was still there. And I don't, still don't know why I was uh, left out of the team. Um, you know, the, to actually be in the team for so long, be the captain of the side and get dropped and be the only person. Um, I don't believe that, uh, I don't believe I was made a scapegoat. Um, they have their reasons for um, you know, standing me down. And sort of thing is, uh, you know, I've watched the tapes over and over again. And uh, I believe I played very well against Scotland in both tests. And uh, that's just my opinion. Ever since that day, three words have been carved into the nation's consciousness bring back Buck. There are as many theories about the reason for Shelford's omission as there are people calling for his comeback. But it was a relatively simple equation. The selectors want a different player equals change. They make the decisions. Buck has won a lot of friends for the way he's handled the whole affair. And he has a lot of support as he tries to convince the selectors he's worthy of a recall. He missed out on a place for the side to Argentina, but that doesn't mean he's given up hope. Again, if the team's picked on form, that uh, if I'm producing the form, uh, there's always that chance of being picked for the World Cup. After all, why should he give up? He's never done so in the past.